Well, let's begin your interview. And uh, I want to find out first, let's start at the beginning. When did you arrive in Tucson? My uh, father died when I was a senior in high school in uh, 66. My mother remarried. I went to college uh, one year in Cleveland, Ohio, at Case Institute of Technology. My mother moved out here with her. She remarried, moved out here. I didn't do very well. I had a scholarship. Uh, so my mother declined to pay any more of the outrageous tuition for that place. And so she said, come out here, you can go to school here, and it's pretty cheap. So I got here in the summer of 67, right? Went to school here, graduated with both a bachelor's and a master's in chemical engineering in 73, and then uh, went to work in California, right? And I, I won't go into all the things I did, but I ended up coming back here in 1986 with my family. Right, and I've been here ever since. So then you're first generation Tucson then? Yeah. yeah. And did you ever live in Southside Tucson? No. No. And do you, um, did you ever, so you just worked in Southside Tucson then? Yeah, I uh, got a job when I came back in 86 with an environmental consulting firm um, as a process engineer. Uh, while I was working with that firm, uh, we uh, got a contract with the Tucson Airport Authority to work with them on uh, reviewing their underground storage tank program. In the 1980s, there were new reg underground storage tank regulations that were going to go into effect at the end of 1987. And so my firm was hired. Actually, I was the one that developed the proposal and so we were actually working with the Tucson Airport Authority as an environmental consultant, managing the removal of certain underground storage tanks and, and testing of potential you know, contamination sites that may have leaked from those tanks, and just generally looking at all of their tanks, making sure they met the requirements for them. And if not, all right, here's what you need to do, right? And then right, they brought in contractors, and so we would look at what they'd done. And while we were working for them, that's when the EPA issued their record of decision. Right, And if you're familiar with the circular process, when EPA e issues a record of decision for a Superfund site, shortly thereafter, they will send out special notice letters to all the potentially responsible parties. And so they sent out, the letters they sent out included the Air Force, General Dynamics, McDonnell Douglas, the City of Tucson, and Tucson Airport Authority, right? Well, the Tucson Airport Authority at that point in time, you know, they ran an airport. They didn't do anything, didn't even have an environmental person on staff. This was a totally new thing for them. And so because we were already under contract, they approached us and said, we need someone to represent us technically on the technical aspects of this uh, negotiation of this uh, consent decree. Would your firm be interested? And so, of course, we're consultants. Of course, we're interested, right? Mm -hmm. And my boss assigned me to the work. And so that's how I got my start. And so from the, uh, the first, my first exposure was you know, working with the attorneys with the airport authority uh, during the negotiation of the consent decree, which took about a year and a half because it was a very, very complicated, one of a kind thing because you have government entities involved, uh, municipal entities like the city, and then private parties like private entities like the airport authority, General Dynamics, McDonnell Douglas and took a very long time, mostly the legal parts, not the technical parts, that we were able to negotiate fairly quickly. But So that's how I got my start. And so is that the first time that you heard about the contamination, or did you know about that site before? Um, I think I knew about it in a general way, right, because it was in the environmental consulting business. So, you know, you tend to keep your eyes and ears open to what's going on, right? But at that time, till EPA... Uh, gets to the point where they're ready to issue the record of decision, there's no action that's going to be taken, right? Because it, it's the way the circular regulations are set up. It, administratively, they have to issue this record of decision, which documents, right, here's the problem, here's the contaminants, here's, here's the extent of the contamination, here's the impact, potential impacts to public health and the environment, and here's what we think needs to be done to fix it, right? And here are the people, entities, uh, that we think are responsible, right? and should have to clean it up, all right? 
And so when we met, you talked about a lot of the history of the area and the industries that uh, were tied to the Tucson International Airport area Superfund site. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could provide some of the history of the, the I guess it would be the TIA property and the surrounding residences that were built, like the track housing and all of that, the good paying jobs, the three hangar industries. Well, the site, the sites came into being at the beginning of World War II. The War Department came there and built uh, the main run, the run runway, which is our, which is the main runway, and the three hangars. They actually built the south half of the two most western hangars first. And then they came back in for a second round of construction and built the north half of the two most eastern hangars and the third hangar. And they were built because at the time they were there were concerns that the Japanese were going to attack the west coast, and so they wanted a place they could fabricate bombers that was safe from that. And once uh, you, with the victories in the Pacific and that was no longer a threat, the way it ended up working was they would build the, fabricate the planes in San Diego, fly them over to Tucson, and Tucson they would be outfitted for whatever theater they were going to, whether it would be the Pacific, North Africa, or Europe, Northern Europe. And so that operation continued there. Consolidated Vault T was the contractor. Uh, they are the predecessor of General Dynamics. And so their operations there, and that was a totally government-run site, and uh, their operations continued through the Second World War. Once the Second World War was over, their operations ceased. Uh, 1948, uh, the federal government uh, approached the city of Tucson. They were operating a municipal airport out of the site where David Thomason is now. And the federal government said, we'd really like to have that site for Air Force Base, which is good, you know and said, we, will, we want to trade you, basically, the site we have here uh, that we built in World War II. Well, at the time, the city was not in a position to operate an airport, so some local uh, people got together and, and put together this air, airport authority. The authorities are a civic structure, and they basically have a membership drawn from the community. They elect a board of directors. And then the board of directors, you know, hire staff and whatever. So it was a unique kind of a setup. There aren't very many airports in the United States that are operated by an authority. Most are either operated by the city, the county, or port authority or something like that. So it's unique. And so this group got together, put down $25,000. They started in operations out of the three hangar area. And, they, and during that time, then in the 50s, um, Grand Central came in. They were a defense contractor. Um, they had contracts with the U.S. government to work on airplanes, either mothballing them or bringing them out of the mothballs because, you know, we have the boneyard at DM. So they were taking planes out of there, putting them in there, and reconditioning. And then and that kind of concur was concurrent with the Korean War situation, right? And then after Grand Central left, McDonnell Douglas Aircraft, which is the predecessor of McDonnell Douglas, operated there up till like the early 60s, I think. Um, and all this is documented in the existing data report, which is part of the what's in the uh, Superfund library. It's in the EPA's administrative record because when we did the airport site investigations later in time, first thing you have to do is you have to document all the history of your site, who the tenants were, which buildings they occupied, what kind of operations did they conduct. So there's uh, extensive documentation of all the information that's available on what the history of the site and who was there and what they did and all that kind of thing like that, right? So then McDonnell Douglas, after that was over uh, in the 60s, then 1963, they built the new, the ter current terminal. It's, it's I mean, it it's doesn't really look like it. The, the uh, concourses are pretty much the way they were, although they were on the ground floor back then. And then since 63, uh, they've the airport authorities operated out, out from there, right? And as you know, they every so often they'll expand it when they went through a big expansion in 2000, I think. So that's kind of the general history, right? And the key point, I think, is that the airport authority was not directly involved other than just being the landlord with any of those operations on the west side of the airport, right? They haven't had anything to do with this. Neither the city nor the airport authority had anything to do with the operations during World War II. They were totally out of control of the U.S. government. 
later on, in the in when we had Grand Central and Douglas Aircraft, they were government contractors. And and if you're familiar with government contracting with defense contractors, um, generally speaking, the government controls everything. They everything the contractor does is is done according to specifications provided by the government. The government owns all the raw materials. The government owns the finished product. The government even owns the waste. Right. So. You can imagine the city and the airport authority when they received these special notice letters saying, hey, we think you guys ought to pay the cleanest messed up. They were going, hey, you know, we, we had nothing to do with this. But under circle of law, the circle of law as the Congress uh, created it, includes this thing called joint and several liability. Joint and several liability basically means anyone who's involved in any way at all can be made to pay the full cost of what needs to be done. And their only recourse is to go into litigation against the parties who are actually responsible to try to get their money back. And I think Congress did that so that these cleanups could be moved forward quickly without having to spend years and years and years and years and years in court trying to get the guilty parties or the parties who are responsible for the contamination actually have to pay, right? Now, at the same time all these things were going on, Hughes Aircraft came to town in the 50s. They, they, they set up their operations, which was hugely important economically for the city of Tucson. And they were, had a major facility down there um, fabricating um, missiles and various things for the U.S. government, right? And they continue to this day. Now it's Raytheon, but doing the same kind of thing, right? So that's kind of the background. And so one of the interesting things that we discussed was kind of the area and how it built up, how a lot of the track housing was kind of built at the time to serve a lot of the workers that were in these well-paying jobs at the time. I don't know if you can talk a little bit. Well, I, I, can't, can I, I wasn't around then, but I can give you what we discovered during our reviews. If you look at the aerial photographs over time, when they first constructed it in the early 40s, there was nothing there, literally nothing anywhere. So they had to bring everybody down there to work on the place, build roads, build railroads, the whole thing. Over time, if, as you look at the aerial photos, you'll see housing areas start to develop. And, and a lot of those were developed uh, to provide housing for the people that worked at these facilities. Because Tucson was a very small place back then, and the most available housing was up in the central area of Tucson. And so only natural land was, you know, inexpensive. And it's like, well, we can build these things down here, and then these people can live closer to their work. Happens all the time. And so, like Mission Manor, for example, was originally constructed and, and occupied by a lot of people that worked at Hughes Aircraft and other places like that. The airport, okay. Now, it wasn't until much later in time when you started to see a demographic shift, when people started moving out of those areas and other people moved into them. And so, um, you know, you have today in the environmental justice movement this concept of where people take these operations that are potentially hazardous in some way or the other and deliberately site them in these low-income neighborhoods just because the land is cheap, the people aren't politically organized and so they can't stop them or whatever. But this is not the case here. Right, because all this stuff was built before the housing was built. When this stuff was built, there was nothing there. Right, so it doesn't. It's not the same set of circumstances. Right. I mean, later they they are impacted by what happened, but it's because they were built in areas you know that were down gradient of these facilities, not the other way around. Mm -hmm. And uh, you mentioned uh, that you first started working at the Tucson International Superfund site as a consultant, mm -hmm. looking at the record of decision when that was put out. And then can you give me some of the details of um, the components of the Superfund process that you were working on or in charge of that time? Well, once the EPA issued the special notice letters for uh, the Tucson Airport Area Remediation Project, which is generically known as TARP, right? Then the, it was like, like I said, it took a year and a half to negotiate the consent decree. At the end of that time, the settling parties had consisted of the uh, Air Force, um, Hughes Aircraft, 
the city and the airport authority. And so uh, there was a lot of work behind the scenes through the political means uh, to persuade the U.S. government to fund half of the cleanup effort and, and that the airport authority basically would fund the other half. The city was not going to be required uh, to put any money into the deal, but they would contribute project management and if we need to build, you know, have wells, um, they would buy the land. If we need to build a plant, they would purchase the land. Um, they would operate it, maintain it. Uh, they would be required to receive the water after it was cleaned up. At the time, the city, uh, because at that point in time, the city was uh, well on its way to switching over to uh, CAP water. They had a, a plan for that. They had been working on it for a long time, building facilities. And so their position was, well, we don't need to pump these wells. We are not going to need this water. And so it's going to impact us if we have to take the water because we, we are already made arrangements to, to rely on CAP water. And so that, we, you know, sit months and months and months arguing about that. In the end, though, they agreed they would take the water, you know, that came out of the plant because there was no good place to put it. The volumes we were talking about were substantial. It, the engineers figured out that you were going to have to pump probably 6,200 gallons a minute, which is a lot of water. And because, you know, water is a resource, you can't just throw it in at Santa Cruz. You can't pump, just spray it across the ground, right? And, and re-injecting it was not really a viable option either at those volumes. I mean, it's theoretically possible, but again, we were trying to capture a plume that had originated at the Hughes Aircraft site, traveled quite a distance, almost five miles, to roughly where uh, Irmington is. The idea is you capture the plume, so you put wells at the end of the plume to capture it so it can't go any further. That's one of the EPA's requirements. You have to contain it. And then we put another set of wells just north of uh, Valencia, about a mile north of Valencia, but on the south side of the airport wash, which were designed to, um, the geology is different. There's like thin layers, and then when you get past uh, wh roughly where the airport wash is, it drops into a big, huge, uh, thousand foot deep undivided aquifer. So the idea was, all right, we have some higher contamination stuff back here. It's in thinner layers. Let's put a line of wells there. We'll cut off this higher contamination material, keep it from getting into the larger undivided aquifer area. And that'll speed up the cleanup. So that was the essence of the design at the time. So the, the, and the deal was that all the parties agreed you know, we, we would proceed under this fashion. And that was quite a political victory that the city and the airport authority, with the help of the Congress, our congressmen and senators, were able to, to work out with the government. The government normally doesn't pay to do cleanups right, this way. So, and the deal was that we would agree to do a cost reallocation. In essence, somewhere down the road, when we finally figured out where did this stuff come from and who was responsible, we will, you know, reallocate the costs among the parties. Now, to further complicate matters, at the same time, there were, num there were a number of toxic tort lawsuits that were brought by the residents of that area with the help of Fred Barron and his uh, law, law firm out of Texas, who specialized in this kind of uh, tort cases. And so you, and that, that started with a, they filed a suit against Hughes Aircraft. Hughes Aircraft turned around and brought in the rest of the parties, um, the airport, the city, General Dynamics, McDonnell Douglas, whatever. And so that complicated coming to an agreement because you have, you had to be careful to protect yourself against the tort suit, right? So it made working together much more difficult, right? But we finally found a way to do that. And then at the same time, the defense, former defense contractors had lawsuits running against the government over the same issues of who did the waste belong to and who was responsible for it because their position was, well, we just did what you told us. We didn't decide to you know, put it in a barrel and take it here or take it there or do whatever. You know, we did what you told us to do. So there was very, very complicated environment. But because people that give the Air Force credit, they they felt a responsibility. They said, you know, we, we want to see this go forward. We're willing to 
put some money into it for now and we'll work on getting it sorted out later. So that's how we got started. So after the consent decree was entered in 1990, then we, there was a steering committee developed, which consisted of the Air Force, Hughes Aircraft, the city and uh, Tucson Airport Authority. And then there was a technical committee that was responsible for the day-to-day -day, uh, work of designing the remedy and getting it installed. Tucson Water provided project management. Now we, there was a fellow from Hughes Aircraft, myself, and a fellow from the Air Force met with the, the party from the, the person from Tucson Water on a regular basis, monthly pretty much, as we, we hired a contract, we hired a consultant, had them design a facility, got that approved by EPA, then hired a contractor, had it built, tested, and it went online in September of 94. And um, it sounds like you worked with a lot of different people then throughout the years. Is there any specific friendships that came about <laughs> with all the work that you did? Well, yeah, I mean, uh, the Air Force people, because they have an off, they have an office or had an office that's no longer there in San Francisco, uh, Center for Environmental Excellence. And they manage Air Force's involvement, because uh, you would imagine most of these defense sites especially the World War II vintage ones, almost inevitably are Superfund sites or have some kind of contamination issue. So they had a group of, of civilian uh, engineers and mixed in with some, you know, uh, serving uh, people. So it's, a, it's lawyers and, and engineers who were responsible to manage the Air Force's participation. Uh, when I first started, it was a guy named Dick Fraser who was very, very helpful to me, just helping me get my mind wrapped around this is what's going on. This is how this works. This, you know, he was very helpful. And then his, his successor um, was also very helpful. Um, Tony Rubound, who worked for the Hughes Aircraft, is one of their project managers who was involved with the water um, remedy, groundwater remedy, was also very helpful. Good guy. I liked him a lot. And then um, David Brazo, who uh, not wasn't really involved in the technical committee, but was involved, worked for the city, worked, started working for the county later for the city, uh, was a good resource. Um, and later on, we got to the airport property remediation, was directly involved. Um, again, good guy and, and very knowledgeable about the community, especially the community issues. He, you know, he's from here, he's a native and, and uh, grew up here. And so uh, very plugged into uh, community issues and had good connections. So yeah, so, I mean, there were lots of people involved. I could give you a big long list, but. but um, and then what are some of the findings of your investigations that you can well, remember? Let me, let me go continue on. So once, once uh, we had the plant in operation, shortly thereafter, EPA issued an order to the airport authority, the city, uh, McDonnell Douglas General Dynamics, to uh, conduct a remedial investigation and feasibility study of the airport property. Because EPA's findings, uh, EPA in the state of Arizona, they, there was no ADQ back then when this was done, but the health department was involved. One of their findings was that they, th they felt that there was, sig there was a contribution to the groundwater contamination that came from the airport property itself. Because uh, we had an old construction landfill, of course we had the three hangars area where you had all this work done uh, we uh, it was known that they used solvents and and worked on aircraft, so it was only reasonable. I, they, I think they thought to assume that that the potential existed that there may have been some contribution from the airport property, and that's the way Circle works. So you you solve the big problem first. What is the thing that's going to most endanger the people's health and the environment? And once you get your hands on that, then you go back and look at all right, where did it come from? Right. So you start looking for where did it come from. And at the same time period, the Air Force had volunteered to clean up Air Force Plant 44. So they, and they have a separate parallel process that where EPA consults, but EPA doesn't control it. And so the Air Force issued their own record of decision in 87 to clean up Air Force Plant 44. And they basically said, we'll clean up everything south of Los Reales Road. Now, the plant doesn't go that far, but their, their groundwater contamination that emanated from the plant had reached, had, well, it actually reached farther than that, but they contended it. Um, that was the place where they they could manage it. So they they picked that, and so we when the 
record of decision came out for the Tucson Airport area of remediation, uh, basically we were required to clean up everything north of Los Reales Road. So that was this magic boundary that divided the projects. Now the reality is the groundwater just flows, so there's no there's no hydrological barrier mm -hmm. there. But but it was a kind of a political legal thing that allowed things to move forward. So anyway, so they issued that order. So now these four parties are back talking to EPA, and shortly thereafter we we we. We didn't have a consent, it's not a consent decree. We have a cons what they call a consent order. Because there's two types of orders. There's an order where EPA gives you an order then can com compel you to do whatever they want you to do. But you have the opportunity to try to negotiate a consent order where you, you voluntarily agree to do what they want you to do, right? In our case, we negotiated with them. All right, what are we gonna do? Timelines, deliverables, penalties, things like that. So that, we went through that and then, um, once the consent order is issued and agreed upon, the court approves it, then that remedial investigation feasibility study started. Okay. So there we had, I was named the project coordinator. Under CERCLA, this, the parties that are involved have to, ha have to name a person to be their point of contact. And the EPA, likewise, they have a project manager. So you have these two parties, and so all the communication goes through them. And that's just to keep things organized, right? So I was a project coordinator, which then made me chairman of our technical committee because we had the same setup. We had a steering committee, which are the principals, um, and then you have a technical committee, which are the, the consultants. Um, in the, some cases, in the case of General Dynamics, they hired an outside consultant. In the case of McDonnell Douglas, they had they were they were bought by Boeing in that time frame, and so they had Boeing had a large environmental staff because they're such a big operation. They have a lot of sites. They work at a lot of sites that are kind of World War II sites, so they end up having a lot of remediation issues. So they had some, <clears throat> they had a, a staff person. And of course, Dave Brosser from the city, that's where he started participating on a regular basis, only on myself. So I represented Tucson Airport Authority, but I was also kind of the project, project coordinator to talk to EPA and then kind of just chairman, if you will, of the technical committee. So we spent five, six years investigating the site and we had to look at everything. We had to look at every piece of property, every area, all the operations. We had to do a lot of uh, field screening and testing, looking for metals uh, and various kinds of things uh, the EPA was concerned about. With the goal being to clear different parts of the airport so we could say, nope, there's nothing there. Right? Because anything EPA, anything that becomes part of the Superfund fight becomes very difficult to, to build anything on, to lease the property to anyone else to build anything on, so it has a huge potential economic impact. So there, the, our goal during the RIFS process was to clear as much of the site as possible so that it would be open, so the airport can continue their economic development, which is, again, helps the economic development of the city itself and the region, and to focus as much as possible on, all right, where exactly do we have potential contaminating issues? So that, that's why it took so long and was quite expensive. But at the end of the day, we determined that the only area that really had an issue was the three hangars area. There was definitely contamination there, significant contamination there, but it wasn't in the regional aquifer. It turns out that you have your regional aquifer then above it, because the water table had dropped over the years, you had another area, what we called a shallow groundwater zone. And it was contained, it was a layer of clay and so you have the shallow groundwater zone under the three hangars. Eventually, as you go west, that all kind of pinches out. By pinch out, I mean those layers kind of all go together. And then if you go far enough west, it's just one big aquifer. Because that aquifer channel that the groundwater plume follows is actually a remnant from the Santa Cruz Riverbed meandering over the centuries. Okay. And so... Um, you have what they call high conductivity channels in the ground, which are these coarse deposits of like gravel and things that the water preferentially flows through. So that's why this plume has that kind of a dog leg to it. It's because of that. So you have this meandering of the Santa Cruz River. And that meandering over time had cut into some of these places where you had the, the these, as the stuff flows down off the mountains over the over the eons, you get layers of 
silt and sand and gravel and whatever, and they all, it's called, they call it a bifurcated stream bed. So you get this kind of thing like that. Paleo channels, I think, is the high tech word to use. And so you have these coming down the mountains kind of uh, from the southwest to the northeast, and then you have the Santa Cruz cutting through that, right? And it just chops that all up, right? And so right there on the other side of the Gauss Highway is where that all kind of this got all chopped up. So anyway, making a long story short, uh, behind the three hangars, uh, during World War II, they had built some small buildings made out of steel. And, and put you know, concrete asbestos siding on them. And that's where they did all of their work with chemicals, fuels, anything like that. Because the hang three hangars themselves are entirely made out of wood. They're the largest freestanding wood structures west of the Mississippi. And they're actually on the list of historic places. And uh, so it was a safety issue, right? In order to, to maintain safe operations, they took all those Anything that had anything to do with chemicals or fuels was kept out of that building, right? Now, they may have been a little bit of solvent use, but it would have been like on rags and things like that. That's what we were able to find out based on our, our research of the historical records. But behind there, you can still go out there today, and, and there'll be big, huge rectangular cutouts, maybe 10 foot wide by 30, 40 foot long. Those are underground vapor degreasing tanks. And so you would... You had racks, you would put the parts on the racks. There was a TCE in the bottom, there were heating coils. There was a lid you'd put on it. The lid had cooling coils, and so you would basically vaporize the TCE. It would rise up, hit the cooled lid, condense, and the droplets would fall down on the parts. And so that was a TCE vapor degreaser. And we had other tanks, chemical tanks, one kind or another. So there was an area behind the, the three hangars where these buildings were. It was highly contaminated. Um, and because, not because there were disposal practices per se, but just because if you have underground lines and you have concrete tanks, things leak, right? And, and it doesn't take very much of this stuff to create a problem. You know, one 55-gallon drum of TC could create all the contamination that was found out of the hangars, right, kind of thing. So anyway, so at the end of the day, there was another consent decree issued uh, by EPA in, in the late 90s, I think it was 98, for the airport property basically said, okay, we've got this contamination, it needs to be remediated, we had PCBs in soils, we had some uh, standalone sites that had low levels of contamination in an isolated area, you had the groundwater contamination, right, and then the Vado zone, which is the area above the groundwater between the, where the groundwater is and the surface, was also contaminated, right, behind the three hangers. So, we had four remedies that we had to work on. And so that came out in 98, and, at the, and then that kicked off a bunch of settlement negotiations between the parties. And finally in 2000, um, that all got sorted out. Um, there were settlements made, and, and uh, the airport received $35 million from the Air Force in the settlement of their, their share, right, of, of the cost of cleaning, doing the cleanup at both on the airport property and uh, groundwater, right? So, well, there's more to that, but I'm not gonna go into that, so. But yes, yeah, so then from um, 2000 forward, then we started the, you know, started the remediation of the four different things built a treatment plant, little on-site treatment plant that they have there at the airport property, removed the PCB contaminated soils, cleaned out the three hangar drains, did a number of things like that were specified, right? And that's ongoing, and, and of course the groundwater project is ongoing, and of course then new things come up. Doxane was the new thing, right? Came up like, I don't know how many years ago, and then just this week, got another new thing. Yeah. <laughs> And so at this point when you're doing uh, the new consent decree at this, I guess it would be in the 1998 times, were you already in your, you're already a project coordinator then for the TI, for the Tucson International Airport? Well, I, the project coordinator role comes from the circular side working, you know, working for the parties, right? So I was a project coordinator during the RIFS part, and then we have this interlude between the record of decision being 
entered and the consent decree because there was a period of time where there were negotiations between the parties over trying to allocate costs and trying to bring in other parties that up till now have not, not been active. And that took a while to, for all that to work out. But yes, once the consent decree for the airport property was issued, yes, I was the named project coordinator on that, right? And I retained that position until I retired in 2015. And that's when you were no longer a consultant and now you work for... Well, the airport authority approached me in 95, basically said, we'd like you to come to work for us full time. They needed an environmental person anyway, because the environmental regulations keep, you know, piling up. They really didn't have a person dedicated to that. So I was basically doing two things. I was handling the Superfund stuff, but I was also handling all their day-to-day environmental but making sure, well, putting programs into place, making sure we had all the right permits, that we were doing all the reporting and the sampling that we were, because there's a lot of things mm -hmm. operationally that you have to do to comply with the various state and federal regulations, county even, county, state, and federal, because county does air quality, and, and then you have waste, well, I won't get into it. There's a lot. But basically, that's what I do. Okay, because I remember that towards the end when you would go and report at the Unified Community Advisory Board, one of the things that you were involved were the solar panels. That was a big thing. Well, I, I, one of my jobs, I work for planning and development, and I also manage design and construction projects because that's my, aside from environmental, my previous career as a process engineer, that's what I did, right? So I did a lot of project management for the airport authority. That was probably 40% of my job doing that. The environmental was the rest of it, right? And then uh, you mentioned the Water Technical Committee. And I don't know if you can give a little bit more information on what it was focused on, maybe the goals of the committee. You already mentioned who participated, but I don't know if you want to talk a little bit more about that. Well, I, I assume you're referring to the, the um, Settling Parties Technical Committee that was involved with the design and construction of the groundwater remediation plant, is that what you want to talk? Yes. Well, again, uh, we had a representative from each of the parties, right? Like I said before, there was a person from Hughes Aircraft, a person from the city, well, in this case it was Tucson Water because they were taking the lead for the city, that was Tom Jefferson. And then there was myself, uh, Dick Frazier from the Air Force, Tony Rubound from, from uh, uh, Hughes Aircraft. So we met regularly. We met with the consultants. Um, Malcolm Perney was hired to design a facility, right? And so we met with them on a regular basis to review their work. Um, and then once that was submitted to EPA and EPA approved it, then we went through a procurement process. The city again provided that service, but we were the reviewers. And so we went through a procurement process, a bidding process to select a contractor. And then once that contractor was selected, then you know, we provided oversight. Again, you know, the Tucson Water had a manager, project manager, but we we were providing oversight, right? So our job was just to make sure things were done properly and, and that what we had hired people to do, they were actually doing, right, kind of thing. And that lasted up through the time that we had the, the, the settlement between all the parties in 2000. Then things changed a little bit because cer certain parties like Hughes Aircraft, the Air Force, dropped out, right? So going after that settlement, it was just the city and the airport authority. So the airport authority was paying the bills, the city was managing, you know, operating and maintaining the plant. Mm -hmm. So I used to meet with us, meet with the Tucson Water guys on a regular basis just to talk things like budget, if we're having operational issues, whatever. And when was the TARP plant completed? September of 94, it went online. Okay. And um, can you define in general, because a lot of people are probably wondering what a consent decree is? Well, it's like a contract. The consent decree, the whole Superfund thing is spelled out in the enabling legislation. Uh, but the layman's term, it's a contract between the EPA and the settling parties. And the EPA says, you're going to do this, 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 and this. You're going to report to us, and this is what you're going to report to us, and how often you're going to report to us. And if you don't do these things, here are the penalties we're going to enforce against you, right? They're called stipulated penalties. They apply mostly during the design and construction phase to encourage the PRPs not to drag their feet, the settling parties, right? And, and, but they can be very onerous. At the time, they were like $25,000 a day per infraction, 
right? Now, because of inflation, they're up more like 37, 38,000. But the idea is to make the penalty so onerous that you're going to do whatever you have to do to comply versus face Because see, you have, you have almost no appeal. If, you, if the EPA thinks you're not doing what you should be doing, you have very limited recourse. You can try to go to the judge and persuade him, but the judges typically give discretion to the agencies. Mm -hmm. And then, and then um, the other thing the consent decree does is it allows EPA the right, if the, if the settling parties are not executing the remedy or are not operating it or maintaining it effectively, EPA has the right to come in and take it over, right? So in extreme cases, and it's happened a couple of times, the EPA will come in and take the whole thing over, right? Now then, then you're in real trouble because now they're doing whatever they decide to do and you still have to pay for it, right? And now they're gonna come after you. So you got lawyer's fees on top of whatever else. So that's the last place you wanna be, right? It's in your best interest to comply. What you, what's really important is, is when you're in the process of negotiating the consent decree and negotiating the deliverables and what needs to be done and how it's going to be done and how do I, and the big one is how do I know when I'm done? What objective criteria do I, are listed in a consent decree that when I meet all these criteria, I'm done? That's really critical because otherwise you, you know, you just never quite finish, mm -hmm. right? So it's a contract basically and, it, and they have a standard form for it, but you can kind of tweak around the edges and technically the technical side, the schedule of the deliverables and what has to be done has a little bit more flexibility. It's based on what's in the record of decision, what they're asking to be done. At the end of the day, once you've reached an agreement, then you take it to the federal court and the judge has to, to enter it, right? With, which is what makes it official, right? But it's like a contract. And what were some of the big memories that you had working on a consent decree as part of the Tucson International Airport? Area? Well, the first one, because it was the first time anybody ever done anything like this, including EPA, my recollection, and I was just, I wasn't a young engineer, but I was new to this, and I'd never been involved with this kind of thing before, is, is sitting with our attorneys, and there was this huge conference table in this law firm up in Phoenix, and that table had to be 30 feet on a side, a giant square table, and so you had all the parties, you know, clumped together, and then they had hired this guy, the city had hired this guy who specialized in negotiating these kinds of agreements, senior attorney, very good guy. His name was Jim Darrow, and he's an excellent attorney and had the patience of Job to deal with all these guys. But it was just an amazing thing to sit there. And, and again, this took a year and a half because there were such convoluted legal issues uh, between the, having the government involved, what they could and could not do, you know, the Air Force, the defense contractors, of course, the city, the airport authority, everybody had their issues, was trying to preserve their rights and... and um, like I said, we wrapped up the technical side fairly quickly with just, you know, say, three, four months. But the legal side went on for, for quite a long time. Now, it's just amazingly complicated, right? And then fascinating at the same time because you have all these attorneys representing the different parties. They have very different personalities, very different styles. And uh, <laughs> it was, it's just, it was a probably the most interesting experience I've, I had had up to that point in my career, right? And uh, how did uh, your research or your work contribute to the airport, the Tucson Airport Remedial Project? Well, again, being a process engineer, during the design of the treatment facilities, um, I basically, wanted to make sure that, that what we were designing and installing was, was going to remove all the contamination that you could measure, right? Because that's all you can do. You can only, you know, it's only what you can measure. So we, over, we deliberately over-designed some aspects of it, right? Uh, plus, we wanted to make sure it was reliable because that's the other big issue, right? So it has to be... Um, designed and uh, control systems in place to ensure that we never ever are discharging contaminated water because we were discharging directly to the drinking water supply, right? So we had to be very careful that the tech, the EPA specified the technology, which was air stripping, but the way you implement it, you have, there are, there are a number of different ways to do that. So we, we deliberately chose ways that would make, ensure to the greatest extent possible that, that we were never 
releasing water that exceeded the drinking water standards, right? And the control systems were designed so the plant would, as soon as the plant had a hiccup, it would shut itself down. Drove the operators crazy because the thing was constantly wanting to shut itself down. But that's, it's like, well, you just have to live with it because we can't afford to have the plant continue to operate and not be safe. And see, that happened up in Scotts, up in Phoenix with the Motorola site. They had a small treatment plant up there and the people that were managing it, whatever, for whatever reason, disconnected a bunch of the alarms. I think I know why. I think it's because the thing was constantly shutting itself down. And so the operators got tired of it. So they literally unhooked some of the, the sensors and uh, various things. So it wouldn't do that. And then what happened is that thing, you know, didn't, it had some issues with the air stripping process. And they were dumping contaminated water above the standard into the drinking water system. Right, and of course, when that happened, that was a huge thing, um, and we had to dig everything out and go to before EPA in the state and say, "Look, here, we're not them. This is not you know we're not doing what we didn't do what they did." Right, and but nonetheless, the agencies were very and rightfully so very concerned that, that the people operating these plants weren't properly maintaining them and they weren't properly designed. It's like, no, no, let's look at it. So we had to go through quite a process with them, Tucson Water and, and, the, and our technical people at the time, to meet with the agencies like, no, this is not the case with us, okay? And these guys, you know, what they did was criminal. You can't basically cut the wires and unhook stuff so you don't have to mess with it and just let the thing run, right? Because you're endangering the people who, who you're discharging this water into their drinking water system. You just can't do that. Well, anyway, so yeah, so that to me, you know, that was the you know, that was the primary thing, is to you know make sure that we were doing what we were supposed to be doing on the plant, and it was you know, and then we tried to build a plant that that would um, um, operate over the period of time it would at the time we thought over the period of time, <coughs> excuse me, that would need to operate in order to affect the remedy, right? To get all the groundwater cleaned up. Turns out it took, it's going to take a little longer than we thought. And um, I think it's either the con it's consent degree actually has a lower standard of cleanup for TCE or trichloroethylene. Well, you have to you have to be clear about that. The consent decree, the the cleanup standard for the aquifer, are is the is the drinking water standard, mm -hmm. right? Because that. Because the government has a standard that says if your drinking water contains, if the level of any contaminant is below the level we specify in our standard, then it's safe. That's what that means, mm -hmm. right? There's a, the treatment standard, however, is different, right? So if you're going to clean something up by pumping, thing, pumping water out, treating it, and re-injecting it, you're never going to clean it up if you're just cleaning it up to the, the final standard. So the treatment standards are typically set lower Right, so the water coming out of the plant had to be, I think it's half the MCL or something like that. Now, what actually happened is we designed it so there would be no detectable levels of TC in the, in the effluent from the plant. That was deliberate, right, because it's going in the drinking water supply. So knowing the sensitivity of the community to these issues, it's like we don't want, we don't want anybody to, to be fearful and afraid that that somehow, even though there's there, that there's something in the water, even though the government says it's safe, there's still something in there, right? And I don't feel safe. It's like, no, best way, we're just gonna over-design the thing, make sure that when that water comes out of the plant, there's no measurable TC. And that doesn't mean there's not any TC in it. It just means that given the technology we have, we can't measure it. And I think this, the, at the time, the limit was like, I wanna say half a part per billion or something like that. But over time, the lab laboratory limits keep getting lower and lower and lower, right? So I, I don't know what they are now. But. And um, I have interviewed other people that talked about when the, I think it's a Tucson Airport Remedial Project uh, first was designed, that it was going to um, shoot out a lot of the vapor into the air. Well, that's another issue, <laughs> okay? Yes, we were using air stripping. What air stripping does is it, it takes the contaminant uh, from the water stream in, into an air stream, right? And then, then the question is, well, what do I do with that, right? So 
the EPA had specified in, in the record of decision that we would put in carbon, activated carbon, mm -hmm. to remove the TC from the air. Now, we had an argument with EPA about that because the amount of, the amount of TC we're removing is very small. And we did a, a, a bunch of uh, exposure studies, right? For, all right, if we, if we did not use carbon, if we just vented the, the wet water vapor with the TC in the air, what would happen to it? And what we found is that at the closest point of public approach, there's a housing development to the north of the plant site, if you remember. And at the time, there wasn't any commercial in there, right? So that whole big, between Irvington and the plant, there no, was nothing, right? It was a Tucson water storage and maintenance area. And there was no, that development across the road from Irvington didn't exist either. That was all open ground. So there wasn't much there. And, and so we did a lot of studies, um, determine, you know, what would happen to this TC? What would the ground level concentrations be at the nearest point of approach? And they were ridiculously low, right? And based on those concentrations, well, you know, we did some, some simple health assessment type studies using very conservative uh, methodologies, like what would the exposure be and what would the health risk be? And we're talking, you know, one in a trillion or something. So we're talking levels way, way below. But nonetheless, EPA was adamant, and the community, and I understand their viewpoint, right? Which is, you know, you can't just take the contamination out of one medium, put it in another, and then let it go. You need, it needs to go away, right? So it's like, okay, fine. So, and it was required by the record of decision anyway. So we put the activated carbon in, and the way that works is then you, the air comes out of the, the uh, stripping column, it's saturated with water, you put it in a heater to heat it up, because the carbon doesn't like water, right? If you get too much water in a carbon, it won't work. So you have to heat the air up, and then as the air flows through the carbon, the TC absorbs onto the carbon, and the air comes out. And again, it's not it, it doesn't have it's not that it doesn't have any TC in it, but the levels are very 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 low, right? As low as we can get them. So eventually, over time, then the carbon fills up with TCE, and so like once a year or something, I think we were, it was once a year or maybe every ten months. You would go in and basically suck, vacuum all that out, replace it with new carbon, and this carbon was made from coconut shells because we did some tests. There's there's carbon made from various kinds of coal, and there's carbon made from coconut shell, and it turns out the coconut shell carbon, because we had very low concentrations of TCE, was more effective at removing it and also at on storing it. So we used that. It was virgin, meaning it wasn't regenerated because you can regenerate carbon. So you and so the carbon then was taken to a, a transported to another site outside this, I think it's in California, it was in California, where was, the TC was thermally destroyed, burned, right? So that way then the con contamination is destroyed, not just moved from point A to point B or, you know, from the air to the water to the whatever, right? So yeah, that was an issue. And I, I mean, I, I get that. I understand why the community was concerned about that. And it philosophically, it makes sense, right? And that's kind of EPA standard. They, uh, the remediation facility the Air Force built down there had the same thing. They had carbon to capture it. And carbon is used a lot. You can even use carbon to pull the TC out of the water directly. Some people do that. Uh, up at the Motorola 52nd Street site, they use carbon uh, to remove the, the contamination up there directly from the water. It's just, it's another way of doing it. Okay. And so I have a question um, that I'm thinking about because you were mentioning how where the Tucson Airport Remedial Project plant, how there wasn't a lot of uh, things around it and now we drive by it and we see a lot of the commercial oh, yeah. things that have popped up. Was there ever a buffer zone that was supposed to go around that? Well, you don't need a buffer zone, but okay. but they did. We ended up building a, a block wall. Okay. Right, because you, you need to maintain security of the site. So the, that, that site has a block wall around it. It's got, uh, Tucson Water has a standard set of security system things they use to protect their sites all over town because, you know, Tucson Water has well sites and treatment sites all over town. So they're all linked into an a, a overview system, like a home security system kind of thing, right? So they have, uh, sometimes they have cameras or different kinds of sensors. So they, they basically integrated uh, that not initially, but in later years when we did some upgrades, they, they integrated this, the security for that site in with their overall secu site security system, 
right? So they have it on the same system now they use to protect all their others. It's mostly the danger is that somebody will get in there and and either want to steal something or they'll you know maliciously just want to start turning valves or doing something that could potentially damage the thing. Mm -hmm. Like I said, the thing tends to shut down at the drop of a hat. So if people start messing with it, it's probably going to shut itself down anyway, right? So, but nonetheless, you just want to keep people out of there. You know, if they're vandals or something like that, right? Mm -hmm. And so when I first met you, I met you at the Unified Community Advisory Board mm -hmm. meeting. And so when did you first begin attending these meetings? Once the, uh, we had the settlement in 2000, mm -hmm. then I became the project coordinator. Um, then I started attending on behalf of the settling parties on a regular basis. Mostly, be, you know, we have an obligation. It's under the consent decree, we're required to, you know, work with the community and report to the community and, and keep them informed. Uh, EPA manages that process. They're the ones that set up these, these uh, groups. Now, usually they call them community advisory boards, CABs. But because they have, there's actually, I think it's seven sub-sites in this larger Tucson International Area uh, Tucson International Airport Superfund site, rather than having seven of these little groups, they combined them into one group because it was just too much. They couldn't find enough people. The burden on those people that were interested was just too much. They couldn't. This way they can get everybody who's interested in one room. And they're, and not all these sites are isolated from each other. They actually, the, in the case of the Air Force Plant 44 site, the airport property site, and the groundwater remediation, they actually go together mm -hmm. because they're not isolated. They're, they're uh, hydrologically, they're interconnected, right? So it's good to have everybody in the same room just so you can kind of get a feel for are the parties aware of what's going on at the other sites? Are they working together, right? So once once we had the settlement, um, then, and I was a project coordinator, so I was obligated, right, to attend um, and let people know, all right, here's what we're doing, answer their questions. And so periodically, when we had something significant to talk about, spend a few minutes talking with them, telling them about, all right, here's what we're doing, answering their questions. And uh, how, how long were you involved in the Well, that would have been 15 years. Oh. I mean, I attended meetings prior to that, but not as the representative, mm -hmm. right? I attended it mostly as the airport, under the, as the airport authorities represented, mostly just to see what was being said and what was going on, right? But not there to actually report and and um, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And did you learn anything from working with community members and the UCAP? Well, sure. I mean, I mean, they have a different. Their issues are different. You know, they're dealing with the impacts. Um, I mean, over the years, I work with a number of people. Uh, Manny Herrera was the key guy. I didn't work with him personally as much. Uh, he actually was very in, uh, instrumental in getting the, the TARP plant finally approved through the community approval process. There were some issues with the routing of the Southern Pipeline um, that he helped sort out. And he worked, there was a TC subcommittee before there was a UCAB, right? It was, came out of the Pima County Health that helped that, and he was part of that. Walter Berg, who was the CEO at that time, was part of it. Working through these community acceptance issues with the pipeline routing, eventually we had to reroute the pipeline along Airport Wash. We had it going down 12th because um, there were some concerns about the impact on the businesses there. And he was very instrumental in helping us get through that process. There was a lot of just anxiety and concerns and whatever. And, and he was a big supporter of the project and the need to, you know, come up with something that would work as, you know, compromise solution that would work best, minimize the impacts would be the way I think would be the best way. And then his daughter later, Yolanda, who was also very active in the community, eventually, I mean, I worked, knew her for many years and uh, worked with her, uh, meeting with community uh, neighborhood associations, right? Again, the ones who were gonna be impacted by what we were doing and later on, she became president or co-chair, excuse me, of the of UCAP, right? Very, very good person, very knowledgeable. And um, how were the community members incorporated into a technical process besides UCAP? Well, that I mean, 
that's a difficult thing. Uh, I, I have give those people a lot of credit. You know, I've been an engineer. For, well, I was an engineer. By then, I'd been an engineer for like 30 plus years, right? Got two degrees, and in, in even some, for me, some of this stuff was a little bit of a stretch. So these pe poor people would come once a month and hear, have these consultants get up and show them slides and talk to them about technical stuff. And, and you could tell that they were, some of them were struggling to wrap their minds around what the significance of it was. What we did is we, we periodically uh, did like an open house type thing. We'd invite them once we had a remedial facility and Tucson Water was doing the same thing and Air Force was doing the same thing. We'd have tours, we'd invite them out, walk them around, show them the, the equipment, talk about how it worked, answer their questions. You know, I, I did driving tours. We would, I'd get a, a airport rental car bus and we would load them up and drive them around and say, okay, it starts here and it goes here and this is where the pipeline goes. And again, just the ones that were interested wanted to be orientated and answer their questions and, and some of them had, I think, a, a good layman's grasp what was going on. Others, not so much. You know, some people just, well, and their focus was different. Some people were more concerned about the health impacts and things like that. And that, unfortunately, when Congress created the CERCLA program, they specifically excluded any health-related stuff. And I found this to be a great source of frustration for the community folks because Health issues were very real to them, and and you know it kept it, all the time I was going to UCAB, it would keep coming up, and then the poor community co-chair would have to go. No, I'm sorry, that's not what we're here for. We can't, you know, we're not allowed to talk about that, or it's not something these people, right, can't help you with that because that's not why they're here, right. So you can see the frustration on the part of the community folks over that, but that's just the way the thing works, right. I mean, we we were helping, so to speak, by cleaning up the contamination, but that, you know, people who consider themselves to be ill or have the potential to get ill, that's hardly any comfort to them, you know. And what do you want others to know about your role with the Tucson International Airport that you might have not already said? Well, I'd like to think that I, I played a meaningful role in, in designing and implementing those re remedies and, and um, Moving the thing, moving those projects ahead, and uh, protecting the groundwater, which is a valuable resource in its own right. Protecting the communities that that are associated with that, right? And um, it was probably the most interesting thing I I did in my career. Am amazingly complicated uh, when you're dealing with. You know, two different regulatory agencies, you know, the community folks, you've got four or five parties, consultants. It's like, you know, five dimensional chess kind of thing. You have all these pieces that you're trying to manage and keep track of and figure out, okay, what do I need? What do I need to do now so that five years from now I have I'm I'm getting the result I want to get? You know, how do we move this thing along, right? What do we need to do? Right. So that was the most interesting, the strategic aspects of it, or I thought were the most interesting parts. I enjoyed it. I thought, I thought it, was, it was the most interesting thing that I did. And when did you stop uh, working at the Tucson International? Well, I retired in October of 2015, oh, and wow. that was it for me. By then we'd hired, we recruited and hired a fellow who had experience, Eric Rudovich, and uh, he took over my position. And he worked there about a year before I retired, and so I gradually transferred more and more of my duties to him, right? To, so what we, because we wanted a smooth transition, um, both in terms of day-to-day -day environmental issues at the airport, plus the Superfund-related stuff. We wanted to make sure that we didn't have any hiccups with that, and that because there's, you just can't. It takes a while to really get your mind wrapped around all the history and all the issues and everything that happened and why did it happen and. How do we get to where we are now? It takes time, you know, to to really um, start to get a feel for that. And even a year after the end of a year, I mean, there's still stuff. That I'm sure Eric didn't realize that he, you know, I told him it's okay. You can just blame me anytime something. <laughs> you know, he's just like, well, Fred didn't tell me about that. I didn't know what to do. So, but yeah. So I mean, that we had a smooth transition. I think relatively so. Mm -hmm. Hopefully. 
And then do you still keep up with the Superfund site? And how if you do? Well, I just read papers, you know, online, whatever I see. I just saw something this week about the latest contaminant of concern that came out of nowhere, caught everybody by surprise. And like I was telling you as we were walking over, I mean, it's TC was that way, way back in the day, back in the 70s. Um, they weren't able to measure for it. I think 100 parts per million was the standard back in the day. And they said, oh, we're good. And then all of a sudden now they can measure in parts per billion. And it's like, oh my goodness, we have a problem, right? So then they start to address that. And then we move up to like 10, 15 years ago when all of a sudden one four doxane, same thing. They could only measure it down to like 100 parts per billion because it's parts soluble in water to a fair degree. And then the technology advances and all of a sudden they say, oh, now, yeah, well, now we can do three parts per billion. Well, lo and behold, our groundwater at the Tucson, uh, the tarp, plume, the groundwater plume, had 1,4-doxane in it. Well, we're not the only ones in it. EPA had, had sites all over the country, some that were ready to close, that when they started sampling went, oh my goodness, we got 1,4-doxane above whatever levels were considered to be safe. And so that set off a whole new round of whatever. Tucson Water ended up building a treatment plant for 1,4-doxane, so we think, all right, we finally got our arms around this, we're good. Here list last week, get something new. Mm -hmm. Right, and the treatment plants aren't effective in removing, so it just never ends. Yeah, you're right on that. Right, <laughs> and then uh, what are some of the most um, vivid memories that you have uh, with working with your colleagues or even your community colleagues? Like, just some of the memories that you might want to share with people. Hmm. Well. I don't know. I don't know. They have. I think when we we had a, a kind of an open house dedication for the Tucson, uh, the groundwater treatment plant, mm -hmm. which was a pretty big event, and um, I thought that was a pretty a major milestone because we had community folks and politicians and everybody and and you know it was just like a, a very good news type of thing you know that we were finally doing that. It's hard to say. I don't know if I have any major things like that. And thinking back on your experience with a super fun site, what would you like to recommend um, future generation consultants or environmental scientists that work on the site? I think the, the only thing I would say is that most people that are involved with this business have too much of a short-term view because they're tasked with, you know, either you know, doing an investigation or designing a plant or, you know, talking to the community or they, get, they have some immediate thing they have to do. And my experience is very few people are really thinking about the, the big picture, right? And thinking about, all right, if I do this today, what impact is it going to have five years from now? Or conversely, thinking about where do I want to be in five years? Mm -hmm. Where do I want the community to be? Where do I want my plant to be or my investigation, whatever? And I, I found that, that that was the one thing um, that I thought was missing, right? Which actually is the one thing that, I, that actually helped me a lot because I, that's, I'm kind of a strategic thinker. That's, my, that's one of my uh, fortes. And so... That I think that helped me a lot accomplish the things I needed to accomplish because I was thinking about, okay, if I do this today, then that's going to put me where I want to be later versus, because it isn't always the most expedient thing to do today or maybe the most obvious thing to do today, right? But, it, but if, if you think about, you know, what do I need to do to get to here, right? Then back your way up, go, okay, if I do this now, then... And then I can do this, and then I can do this, and then I can do that, get, and get this result I want out here. So that, that I think that, and, and not to be critical of the agencies, but again, they, you know, they have their issues, they have their things they have to do, and a lot of times they're more concerned about, well, I have to check off this box, I have to get this thing done. And so they just focus on that, and they don't really think about longer term, right? And how do you think, or how would you like the memory of your experience to be remembered? 
Well, with the community folks, I always try to be open and honest with them. It's like, I'm not going to lie to you. you know, I'm, I'm going to tell you the truth, whether you like to hear it or not, right? I like to be remembered as someone who is trustworthy, right? And, and a person of integrity. Because oftentimes the people on the stakeholder side are vilified because like, well, you're evil and you're industrial polluters and you know you don't care about the community and all you care about the money. Well, yeah, I care about the money because if I don't care about the money, I'm not going to be able to do the cleanup and protect the environment and protect the community. I have to care about the money, right? So, and, and sometimes what people want is way beyond what's reasonable, right? Because to be truthful, there's, there's a number of folks out there that think any level of contamination is unsafe. I mean, and they really, really believe that, right? And there may be some justification for that, but I, I personally don't think that's true. Because I spend a lot of time with toxicologists, and I won't get into the arcane bits of that. But there's, there's, there's more than one school of thought about how much contamination is safe. So, so again, you have, to, you have to have someone of a practical approach. Let, you know, let's do what we can do, that we can afford to do, that's still protective, right? Versus, well, we just have, you know, there can't be any contamination. I mean, I feel for people that have this environmental anxiety. We have it in Tucson. They're so afraid of everything in their environment. The water, the food, the air, you know, there's everything out there is, you know, trying to kill me. You know, that's that's a shame that people reach that state of environmental anxiety where they anyway, I'm getting away from your question. No, I'd I try to conduct myself as a person of integrity. Someone who is trustworthy and believable. Well, you know, I'm not gonna lie to you, I'm gonna tell you the truth. I, you know, and if I if I make a mistake, I'm gonna own up to it. Right? I'm not, I'm not gonna hide it or pretend it didn't happen, kind of thing. So yeah, that that'd be it. And how do you think that the memory of the Arizona, the Superfund site and the contamination will be remembered down the line in the bigger picture? <laughs> well, that's a tough one because you've got so many facets to that, right? You have the technology parts. Where, you know, did the agency, were the agencies effective? Well, everything took a long time, right? You know, when I started, you know, they were all saying, well, we'll have this knocked out in 20 years. Well, 20 years came and went. We were still working on it, right? So you have that. It's a very slow process, and then the cleaning up's even longer, right? And then from the community perspective, I think they they kind of feel like, well, you know, yeah, you're cleaning things up, but we have all these issues, whether it's economic impacts, because there is economic impacts. If you're part of a Superfund site, to do any kind of business transaction makes your life much more complex. Right, so there's this long-term, even though EPA wrote letters and, and did various things and the Congress people tried to do, you know, to assure the lenders and other people that, well, you know, these people are not part of this, this land is not part of this, you'll be safe, it's okay. But even then, there's still this implication, right? Kind of thing. So you have that, you have the health issues, you have just the general, you know, why don't you guys clean this up faster? And then, of course, we keep having these emerging chemicals so everybody starts to feel comfortable, like, okay, I think we got this, you know, we got treatment plants, we know where it is, we're, you know, it's not in the water supply, you know, whatever, and started to relax a little bit, and then boom, some new chemical comes that nobody heard of, which all of a sudden is an issue, and the government says, well, it might be a problem, we're not totally sure, but we think if you're going to be safe, you shouldn't drink it if it's above this level, and that just starts the whole thing over again, mm -hmm. right? So. Yeah. And did you attend any, or it seemed like you're very focused on remediation, but did you attend any of the health study meetings or were you involved in anything that had no. to do with health? Okay. No, we were not directly involved with that, although we, you know, the, there were numerous health studies done by Pima County. The state did some. The big one was the ATSDR epidemiological study, which was done. Uh, I forget the time period, but they came in and, and did one of them, a very, very thorough and very expensive, over a million dollars, study, epidemiological study, and they compared, uh, they had a control population taken from the area of Speedway and St. Mary's, and then they had the target population taken from the mission manager area, and they did the full spectrum, you know, doctors, visits, and tests, and whatever, comparing you know, like a grandma from here with a grandma from here and a, you know, whatever. 
and very, very complete, very comprehensive, did their own sampling, did their own assessments of everything, you know, true third party assessment. And at the end of the day, uh, and, and the community was very excited about this, especially some of the activist groups, because they thought, well, this is going to definitely prove that our health issues here are directly related to this groundwater contamination. Well, what happened was it didn't turn out that way because they ran the epidemiological studies, did the statistics, and they said, well, statistically, there's no difference. Well, that just set off a firestorm with the activist groups because they felt betrayed, you know, because in their minds, they're convinced that, that um, there were significant health impacts here that were related to the groundwater contamination, but the epidemiological study didn't show it. And then your opinion, what is the importance of this site, maybe at an Arizona level, at a national level? Well, I can say that EPA frequently told us over the years that this is one of the better, more cooperative sites that in Region 9. You know, Region 9, that's uh, the West, includes Hawaii, I think. Uh, and because they would always tell us that, frequently told us that, and it was true because we, we were proactive, we got ourselves together, we, we got the remedy in place, they didn't have to take us to court. You know, we had a reasonably cooperative relationship with the agencies, by and large. We got along with each other. There were times that we got a little crosswise, but but generally we got along pretty good and, and kept the thing going forward. And so from that standpoint, we were, we were a good example of what, you know, how CERCLA should work and how it could work, you know, and, and get the remedies in place and, and and do what the community needs to have done kind of thing. And so you provided some advice for your colleagues, the consultants, and then some environmental scientists, but what advice do you have for state and federal governments to receive the, the cleanup? Well, the <laughs> well, they, it's, I'm really reticent to give them advice. They have their own issues, right? They're not my issues, right? They're, they live in a different world. Okay, the, the issues we had with them were typically, um, they would want all kinds of things done. It was like, well, you know, you realize that costs money, you know, and we have limited money. We can't just do everything. We have to do the right things, the things that are most useful to us, not just to satisfy because you want to know more, right? Because that, that's a normal thing. You know, if you're a scientist and you're investigating something or observing something or tracking the development of a thing, you always want more data. That's just normal. And so the agencies are always like, we want more sampling, we want more wells, we want more of this. And it's like, guys, I can't afford to pay for that, right? We have to, we have to do things that make sense to us. And, and, but it still you know, can make sure that we're properly monitoring, properly tracking, properly whatever, investigating. So that's there. And, and what's interesting, of course, is that when you come to a state lead site or an EPA lead site where they're paying the bill, their attitudes change. Right, so it's like, who's paying a bill? And then the second thing is, um, I didn't find this too much. Occasionally we'd run into somebody who had this attitude that, well, you know, if you're a stakeholder, you're, you're evil and we have to keep an eye on you because you're gonna do bad things. And it's like, are, are you kidding me? It's like, we've been doing this. We volunteered to do this from the beginning. We, the airport authority, had nothing to do with any of this and yet here we are bearing all the burden. Right, so don't tell me we're bad people that just want to get away with polluting. That's not true. So there, and and it's some of it's ideological, some of it's just a, you know kind of a viewpoint thing. Then and it's true because these uh, people that do this on the agency side run into outfits like this that are indeed bad people and are indeed trying to get out of doing anything meaningful, right? And so I I understand that, but it's like well that's not us, you know why are you treating us this way kind of thing. And do you have any education or communication recommendations for new um, generations that are active at the community well, level? Well, I think it's good for them to be involved. I mean, these are very slow developing things. They have a lot of history, especially here. And you have to be leery of just jumping into it and, and without being aware of the background. Because sometimes things are the way they are because of other things that have happened way in the past. I mean, you know, me immediately obvious. 
But you just have to kind of, I mean, I give credit to people like, say, Gerald Corte, who was in UCAB all the time I was involved with the site. And he's older than me. And, and he just kept, you know, plugging along, coming to every meeting. And he was kind of nice, steady kind of a, a person that, that um, wanted to know what was going on, would give us the benefit of the doubt, but occasionally would step up and say, you know, guys, I don't think that's the thing we need to do. And I always appreciated him because of that, right? Because it takes a lot of, I mean, they didn't, I got paid to go to those meetings. They did not, right? And I give a lot of credit to folks that come, you know, year in and year out, listen to this stuff. Sometimes they get it, sometimes they don't. But they just keep after it because they're, they're concerned. They want to make sure that the thing gets done, right? So you got to give folks a lot of credit. And then like Ignacio and Yolanda who, and Tom Stubblefield and all these people who stepped up to be the community co-chair, it's not an easy job at all. you got to deal with all these the community types. Some of them have totally different agendas. Some, and we've had people come in over the years, try to hijack the UCRAB group for some cause or another and the co-chair and, and, and other long-term kind of members would try have to deal with it, have to go, no, we're not doing that. We're not going there. That's not what we're here for. So again, you just have to get plugged in and it's for the long haul. But you have to educate yourself so you can understand what they're talking about. And through all your experience as an environmental consultant, has um, and your experience at the Superfund site, do you think that it's changed your thinking about sources of chemical exposure in your household or your community in general? No. No? No, because, because I know a lot about it. I realize that most of what gets told the public is wrong. It's been sensationalized. Okay. So, I, if any, well, no. Mm -hmm. And what additional information would you like to have in regard to the site that you might not have currently? Well, I'm not really interested in it too much anymore. <laughs> right? yeah, you're retired. So I'm, I'm out of it. I did my almost 30 years. And so, you know, it's time to, to pass the baton off to others. So, I mean, I, I like to, to, I'm interested in generally in, in how it's going and, and how things are going to get resolved. Right now, you've got this new issue, which I can only imagine what those poor guys are going through with this. The city, especially the Tucson Water guys, they worked so hard to rebuild their standing in the community, and then you have this come out, and then it turns out, well, they were they were sample. I mean, it's complicated, so I won't get into it. But but I can just imagine their anguish now that you know they had they went through this whole thing to deal with the doxane problem. City put up their own money to build the plant, right? Try to get it back from the government. Um, and now they got the exact same problem again. Is there anything else that you'd like to comment on that maybe the questions have missed or just something that you would like to say in addition? Hmm. Well, I just thank you for giving me an opportunity to, to chat with you, right? Share my observations and I wish you the best of luck in pulling all this together.